Mm -hmm. news this evening, jurors in the Larry Hoover conspiracy trial got a chance to hear tape-recorded conversations for the first time today. It's real in the Wind City, y'all, huh? Look. I grew up with a new breed of black gangs and disciples. Vice Lords that had black souls who was placed in a cycle. Plus, I stood on all four corners and played with the hustlers. With the kings and Latin folks who gave a fuck about nothing. It's Chicago, this how we play around here. Niggas be on bullshit every day down here. Just like that. Hey, Sam, out here, Carver. I'll take real time to see how he's Why? Why do you believe that you should be really. Basically, I think I'd, I'd done my time. I, I paid my debt, but... Hey, yo, one of the realest things I heard a nigga say was, it ain't where you from, it's where you at. A lot of motherfuckers get it twisted. Post up out of town and think shit is sweet. Forget about the natives, the niggas that run the land. Every city has some kind of force. Chicago ain't no different. Shit, this was the home of Capone. The land of Hoover. The city of GDs. And just like any hood, niggas get it. Motherfuckers die. Niggas pull it just to get on. Shit, that's just Chicago's way. From the politicians to the police. It's always been like that. Probably always will be. Gangster. Matthew, why don't you tell the people what it's like, man, coming from the Shaolin. Niggas don't know about this shit down here, the gangs and all that. Chicago, I think more than any other city, even LA, is a city of neighborhoods. And uh, I mean, it, it's uh, not just a, a phrase. I mean, you can go four blocks, six blocks in Chicago, and you are in a different neighborhood with a different name. And the city of Chicago even designates all these different neighborhoods on a map. It's like we are in a city of maybe 50 or 60 different little towns, but it's all the city of Chicago. And I think from way back when, uh, even in the uh, 1900s, uh, early 1900s, late 1800s, you had all these different ethnic uh, groups that came into Chicago and they said, this is my part of the city and you're not going to come in it. And if you do, I'm going to knock you over the head or whatever. And this, this is, so this has been part of Chicago's history from the beginning. Um, you had uh, the Irish gangs, you had the Italian gangs in the early 1900s that kind of lived through the mid uh, 1990s uh, and then uh, you had these uh, street gangs, the Hispanic and black street gangs and uh, they are dominant in a lot of the neighborhoods in Chicago too. It's the same uh, mentality as, as all the other ethnic groups had in Chicago. You're not coming into my neighborhood. You know, like, Chicago is known for the takeover, man. You know what I'm saying? We created the takeover. Niggas wouldn't even be able to say they was gangsters if it wasn't for the shot. You know what I'm saying? Niggas say, okay, well, Al Capone in Brooklyn. That nigga wasn't shit until he got here. It was already gangsters here before he got here. You see what I'm saying? That's the part they never tell you about. And it was black gangsters like you and me. You know what I'm saying? Sam Young and niggas that started the lottery and then that shit went to the Queen and Harlem and all. But all that shit was here. Every game originated from some type of substance from Chicago, you know what I mean? Whether it was GDs, whether it was Black Star Range. The game is the same anywhere. We can go to LA and go out to Compton and you find the same stuff. It's about survival, it's about deprivation. It's about. A real G can't recognize another real G, and that's a little shit. Like, a, like in this community, goddammit, if I grew up in this neighborhood and this GD's over here, I'm a GD, because I can't go over there where the Stones is and be saying I'm a Neutron. Niggas see me with the folks every day. So even if you wasn't a gangster, you was a gangster if that's where you grew up at. That's just how Chicago is. It ain't like we grow up and we say, goddammit, man, I'm finna choose, or my, my goal in life is to be in the gang. It's just like, this is just the way of life. You, know? you is what you is, because where you stay at. You BD if you stay in the BD neighborhood. You GD if you stay in the GD neighborhood. You MC if you stay in the MC neighborhood. Wherever you stay at, that's what she is. Break down, gang. Break, what's the definition of a gang? Break it down. Oh, man. Oh, okay. I guess the definition of a gangster, man, be a strong superior, man, that has a, a henchman, you know, the henchman behind him. Break down the cycle. Tell me about some of the gangs that you seen while you was growing up. 
Every last one of them motherfuckers. Every last, if, if you're not in it, you're around it, you know somebody is doing it. You know what I'm saying? It's just it's just a life here. You know, they got this shit out in L.A., mm -hmm. but it's the home of the original game bankers, man. I mean, if you can't do it here, you can't do it no motherfucking way. And I agree with that because Chicago's known for people like Al Capone and all that. But let me tell you, which one do you think was the most influential gang doing your upbringing in Chicago? Them gangsters. <laughs> them GDs, baby. Them GDs was on their shit. But that's because I grew up on St. Lane Street. But them, you know, the Stones was doing their things, and you know, shit. When I was a young, shit, we didn't even think Larry Hoover was alive. And then it was, it was. I was went to school with one of his sons in grammar school. Then I went to school with one of his sons in high school. I used to be like, damn, this, this shit is for real. You know what I'm saying? But uh, it ain't no myth. It ain't no joke. Niggas do get their ass whooped out here about them gangs still. Stand the fuck up. Go. Uh, I'm from the city of Al Capone, Larry Hoover and Jeff Ford, Fluky Stokes, King David and Willie Lord, bang out, hats to the right or the left, jump niggas and they side till they lose their breath, Man. stomp niggas up with pride cause we ride to the death, got the coke on the block so we strive for wealth, every gang got lit so we out for self, and we killing up each other till there's no they one kill left. A lot of people. They killed a lot of people? Oh, man. They kill Tell me what it's like coming from Chicago. Uh, GD Town. What's that like? Man, it's kind of hard, you know what I'm saying? If you want GD, you probably was getting beat up. If you want BD, you was getting beat up. Right, right. From the low end from where I'm from, you know what I'm saying? I stay down on 41st, but everybody game back at 44, 43rd, State Way, all that, you know what I'm saying? But, I mean, you know, they had their thing. You know, for the wild hunters, man. Yeah, you had to be claiming something, you had to. So what, what, block, going there. what block you come from? He wanted to talk about coming up in the era of in the GD era. It, it was kind of it was rivals. You had the GDs, you had the brothers. I came up in that era, you know, back in the late '80s and stuff. It was it was a little hectic, man. Word up when you was younger. Cats uh waiting after school. GDs all across the street. Down the street you got the brothers uh, clashing at White Castles, McDonald's, all types of shit. GDs putting six point stars in the middle of the sidewalk. Students walking outside of the sidewalk on the street because you couldn't walk over that star or niggas would beat you half to death. Uh, couldn't bang your hat a certain way. You better wear your shit straight like this. Like this. No, no none of that. No none of that. No, no, no don't even hang your shit. Right now when gang from Chicago, one of my targets is Larry Hoover. I don't, I, I'm not sure I want to get into that because I, I don't understand nothing about this to get. I, I, can, I can deal with what we're here to deal See, with. See, the reason why a lot of niggas don't be talking about GD because they got the wrong perception of it. Everybody's still talking about gangster disciples. That's more like in the 80s, man. It's bigger and better things. It's more about growth and development. It ain't just about not talking. It's about knowing the constitutional rights. Tell me, in your opinion, what is... What does GD mean to you? What is the and we don't have to specify GD. What does who asked that? I'm not answering that one. <laughs> what does GD mean to you? Or just in your upbringing? What that is? I really don't know. <laughs> Anybody in here know what that is? Gangs ain't just now started. There was gangs before these black gangs came even into existence. There was gangs before that. There was the Hamburgers, you know, and some of the other Irish gangs that was coming up. And they were killing people. They was extorting people. They were doing all the things that they say blacks are doing now. And the thing is, is that they went on to become legitimate. That was supposed to have been a, a, an adolescent period that they went through. But they had people of the older group who molded them and guided them into City Hall, into industry, into the other departments of government, and now they are upstanding citizens within the society in which we live. In order to know a man, you must know the content of his character. You can't really judge a man based on what he says. Some jail shit, Fuck what a nigga say, watch what he do. But in order to find out if that's true or not, you gotta give that man a chance. It don't really matter if he was a GD, if he was a mole, if he was a blood, if he was a crip, hustler, whatever you is. Somebody gotta give you a chance. And although we all make mistakes, we could be redeemed. So I ask myself, what is the content of Hoover's character? Well, it 
Anytime you do a do a that's the time amount of time, it can have two effects. It can harden you, or it can make you think. And uh, I thought, what have you thought? What are the thoughts like on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, basically, uh, you think about preparing yourself for the future and preparing yourself for one day when you will return to the streets. If you're prepared, if I'm prepared, I have, uh, I've got employment. Uh, I want to do something for the community. Uh, I see these kids coming in here every day with 10, 20, 30, 40 years in life wasted just like I wasted mine uh, because of uh, ideologies, street gangs, uh, one teenager don't like the other teenager because the way he wears his hat because his ideology is different from his. Uh, a disciple don't like a vice lord. We all black people. She has always been uh, lovely child. And all this stuff he gotten into, I don't know why and what reason to get into it, because he, he was a child has always understood good. He would go out there, if he pulled, took it a little way up, and went to the NP at that time, we had A's and P's, and delivered people's groceries. Larry's gonna bring that money home and give it to me. He made sure that we didn't suffer even from a kid coming up. That's the type of person there was. Well, you know, first of all, it was just an honor to meet him. You know, he's a quiet person, highly intelligent, uh, you know, very nice, you know, uh, very good brother. And we had an opportunity to meet. Uh, he was somebody that all my life, I used to be a GD. So brothers, um, had always told me that he was somebody that I was somebody that Mr. Hoover would like to meet, and that I would and, and that would you know embrace me. And, and I was always a, a, a thinking person. I found Larry Hoover to be highly, highly uh, intelligent. You know, a, a true born leader. And it was interesting that I had saw on national television one night uh, they were talking to Bill Clinton about a gang. Uh, they had a gang uh, task force throughout the United States, and they were talking about the disciples, and they mentioned Larry Hoover's name. And so the next day when I saw Mr. Hoover, I, I, I told him that I saw them talking about him on national news and I was concerned. And Mr. Hoover said to me, he said, man, uh, he said, I know I'm never getting out. He said, I'm not concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is my family. He's a true giant. That, excuse me, that man had no regard for, for himself, but had regard for his family. He's very family orientated and uh, he was a good brother. You uh -huh. know, we had three brothers. Why well, had? I did have three brothers. I only have one now, two is deceased. But Larry was always understanding. He was the oldest. <clears throat> he was the oldest. You know, during holidays, he was always there. You know, Christmas time, by my mom being the mom and dad in certain situations, mm -hmm. uh, he would always say, Mom, don't worry about me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Make sure Diane and Ronnie and Charles Ray was taken care of, you know. We, we had a lot of good times together growing up. Giving it to you from a Neutron's perspective, uh, Larry Hoover stopped a lot of bullshit in the hood that the police could never stop. He's, a, he's, a, he's an excellent guy. I remember once when we was about 10 years old, he was playing in the streets, and uh, a guy had, uh, he was playing on the pole, and a fellow had put me to sleep. So exposed me till I remember when Fred put me to sleep, and I fell out on the street and all other chumps was around laughing and nobody came to my to my age but Larry. What would Larry do? He picked me up. Shook me out. Got me back got, my, got me back to conscious. When I think of Larry Hoover I think of two years ago scenarios. Uh, one is this um, monster that the government wanted to create. That this was this horrible person who ran a gang from a prison for over 20 years. And then I think about the Larry Hoover, the individual that I know, uh, who is a very bright, very articulate, um, a young man who has the ability to influence people to encourage people to do the right thing, a person who is just
All I can say is that, uh, uh, I can't take back what I've done. After the, uh, I've been convicted of, all I can, all I can do is try to do something to make sure that this doesn't happen again by using the time that I've done and the thought process that I've developed to try to make sure that no other youngsters don't do the same thing I did. They said time is a virtue like matrix. A weak mind in the hurt you get play tricks. If the rhyme that can curse you like that shit. Like eight miles in the country you can't say shit. I walk with Father Time as I spit this rhyme. Footprints in the sand like a Christian sign. George Bush prime time couldn't stop this grind. They just want me to sing eight con like shine. So I they say gangs are usually started because there's a lack of parental guidance. But that wasn't really so with Hoover. Because of his family values and his beliefs, it made him a natural leader. People seemed to flock to him. By 1969, Mr. Hoover had started an organization that had spread through much of Chicago, and it's estimated there were 10,000 members strong. Perhaps this is where the problem really started. You gotta realize, when this thing was first put together, you know what I'm saying? Um, it was BGDN. Now, we're gonna talk straight out, we're gonna talk straight out. And when it was BGDN, you had David Boxdale, you know what I'm saying? And you had Larry Hoover. And as they come together as one, you know what I'm saying, it became BGDN, Black Ants Disciple Nation. In 1969, we combined forces and we established two kings and two princes. Uh, I was very instrumental in the disciples and the gangsters coming together. When I went to jail in 1968 for failure to register a gun and unlawful use of a weapon, I met David Boxdale while I was in the House of Correction. We was at odds when we first met. After a while, he began to love me and I began to love him as my brother. When I came out of jail in 69, uh, Hoover was ambassador of the Stones. We had a nation meeting of the gangsters, and I said I wasn't going to be no stone. That night, Hoover called Jeff Ford and told him that uh, he could no longer be a, be a stone or ambassador of the stone. Wait a minute. Hoover called, who called who now? Say that again. Hoover called Jeff Ford. Right. And told him that he could no longer be uh, affiliated with the stone. And, and, and I believe he did that out of his love for me. The next day, Jeff came to 68 degree and wanted to try to straighten it out. We wouldn't hear of it. So he left with a little anger. About six months, six months later, six or seven months later, with me talking to Larry, and me also keeping in contact with David, I had a chance to bring them together. And we sat and we decided that we would, it would be an equal partnership. That's how it got to be two kings and two princes. Name the two kings and name the two princes. David Boxdale and Larry Hoover Combined makes up the king of the black gangster disciples. Tennessee and a brother named Old Timer was their prince, their second in charge. With the players of power in position, Hoover and Boxdale start to flourish. GD spread rapidly, but in 1973, according to court documents, Hoover allegedly orders the execution of William Pookie Young for robbing one of his narcotics houses. Hoover is arrested and charged with murder. And although he never pulled the trigger, Hoover is found guilty and sentenced to 150 to 200 years. 23 years old, in Statesville Maximum Security, 
With two football fields facing him for numbers, Hoover still continues to grow. While incarcerated, he starts to establish guidelines for his followers. And like any good thinker, he puts it down on paper. And the paper is known as the blueprint. This blueprint is a bound copy of a jailhouse manual. ATF recovered this manual as a jailhouse, uh, a, almost a Bible for the street gang. Growth and development, it's GD, it's, it's the same thing. This is just a bound version to cover up what these guys are putting together in jail to structure their street gang. It's, uh, it's a reshaping. Uh, when, you, when you take away a man's freedom, then he, he looks at life in a whole different manner. He, uh, he knows the importance of his own mortality and the importance of human life itself. Uh, his values change. To me, when Brother Hoover let it be known about the blueprint being published and put something that once was secret into the public domain, let everybody know that it was about evolution from gangster disciple to growth and development. So everybody didn't want to hear the social change for a positive end, they still stick to that gangster disciple. That's on them. What Larry Hoover is about, and those that's locked up is about, and the concept that I'm about is growth and development, making the individual have a right to grow and develop. Gator Bradley has become the consigliere of Chicago street gangs. I think growth and development uh, is, not is not necessarily what the gangster disciples are all about. Um, I think that might be a farce. Uh, I, I see that the Gangster Disciples, uh, 14 years after growth and development became a catchphrase, um, are as powerful and uh, ruthless as ever. However, the same corporate structure that seemed to govern the Gangster Disciples in the 90s doesn't seem to exist as strongly anymore. And there's a lot more independence in this organization. And it's a lot more about me dealing drugs in my neighborhood making money than it is in and, and uh, honor and respect and that kind of stuff. But as far as the uh, growth and development goes, I think there are certain people in the organization that use that for their own political ends, and they still are to some degree. But, um, and maybe some of those people are legit now and they are in, interested in politics and furthering people's, uh, um, making, benefiting the community through politics. But as a whole, I don't think that that's what the GDs are about. By 1987, time had brought about a change. Hoover had gone through the metamorphosis from gangster disciple to growth and development, but the authorities said it wasn't so. According to the authorities, they said he was dealing drugs. They said what made this easy was the constant flow of GD members' movements in prison and the streets. In other words, he could just give an order and have someone deliver whatever. In addition to the accusations of him getting whatever in jail and moving whatever in the streets, it was alleged that he was starting to swell in size. GDs had spread to 35 states, and with the increase of members and the increase of power, you know what they say, when Peoples was watching. These aren't kids uh, anymore in, in the gangs. This isn't the West Side Story of the, of the 1950s uh, movie. These are businessmen. This is the new outfit. This is the new uh, face of organized crime. In the late 80s and uh, very early 90s, they became a, a national force by uh, recognizing outside markets outside of the city of Chicago and began putting their members into various cities throughout the United States. The, the gangster disciples are now in a position to import uh, narcotics from foreign countries. They're controlling the distribution of narcotics in uh, Chicago. What do you know about Larry Hoover's GDs? I know that Larry Hoover's GDs are considered to be the largest, most powerful gang in Chicago. Um, they have are almost like a corporation. They have branches all over the country. I've gone to Winona, Minnesota, and talked to GDs who have who are working out there through their small towns or in army bases or everywhere. Larry Hoover devised while he was in prison a structure that would m mirror a corporate structure. He placed himself at the top as chairman of the board of directors. Immediately beneath him was the board of directors. Approximately half of those members were incarcerated and they controlled the prison system. Half of them were unincarcerated. They controlled the gangster disciples operations on the street. The black gangster disciples 
were a Fortune 500 company, they would be in the top 10%. Um, I know that the organization has changed over the last decade and a half or so. Um, it, they really kind of entered Chicago's consciousness in the 90s uh, when the when 21st Century Boat was uh, formed and and thousands of people uh, uh, were mobilized uh, to vote in, in elections and try to try to get some candidates affiliated with the GDs elected to office. It didn't really happen, but um, it attracted a lot of attention, especially Mayor Daley's attention. And so the, the GDs um, suddenly were in the spotlight. And it was about that time that Larry Hoover's uh, uh, um, uh, conspiracy case came to a head. And um, a lot of people think there was some sort of linkage there between how the GD suddenly became a political threat and how Larry Hoover suddenly uh, uh, caught this federal case and went away for life. But do you feel the government feels that when Mr. Hoover said uh, real gangsters don't kill each other, they go to the polls, that they looked at that statement as an attempt for GD to be legitimate? The thing is, is that the old Mayor Daley, the father, he belonged to a gang that he helped develop, helped create. He went on to become the mayor of this great city we call Chicago, along with the people that grew up with him, his friends, his buddies, his allies. At one time, they had their fingers in everything in the city, things that were illegal. And then they began to get off into business. They began to control the commerce within the community and then politics. It is a natural growth process for people who do illegal things within the community to at some point wake up, get a clue about this ain't working for me or my kind or my community. And so therefore, let me get off into business, let me get off into politics. When he began, when Larry began to talk in those kinds of terms, they put an X on him. It is what it am, though. You gotta stand. You got a you got a person who has a considerable amount of power, and they feel they can they can no longer control this person. They dispose him. If he's a leader, they dispose him. That's what they do. You know what I'm saying? And what they feed through the media is propagandized. You know what I'm saying? You know what the news is? News is opinion based with twisted fact. That's all it is. Now it'd be factual situation. You know he is who he is. You know people put a whole lot of negativity on it but in the raw when these people out here see a powerful black man who can get together a bunch of people like that at one time you know what I'm saying sometimes they don't want that you know what I'm saying still incarcerated and definitely a marked man according to the authorities he still controlled a hundred million dollar a year drug empire while on the inside he controlled more of the outside than the average man on the outside actually did in addition to that, there was the birth of 21st Century Vote. It was a time that he would take his organization into the political arena, thus enabling jobs for his community. As negative as the government alleges, makes me think of one of the oldest cliches said, can a negative be turned into a positive? According to the authorities, hell no. I think every man can change. Every day you change. Uh, you can't never persuade the person uh, your actions got to tell, got to show whether you were changed or not. That's the only way I can answer that. My actions don't show that I've changed. My actions up to this point show that I'm, I'm trying to make a change, trying to be accepted in this room. He's trying to override everything that he's did wrong, and I know, I, and I know this. You know what I'm saying? And I know this, and I and. I can't knock that man, because if that's the case, how I'm going to knock everything I've been through, and now what I'm trying to do is possible. But I don't think you can mix gangs and guns and drugs with a progressive and a right process. You just can't do that. If the gangs are killing, if the gangs are promoting drugs, how in the world can you call that good? That's bad. 21st century vote is the political proponent of this whole evolutionary change. Okay, it, it's a gang force using a political banner. The concept is to make them niggas vote. I think a lot of it is political. He was a black man that had the power to come out and, and galvanize votes across this country. And when the uh, 
government found out that you know he was that he had plans through 21 century vote to come out and be involved politically that's when they went about uh, going about the process of trying to have him indicted on um, on these conspiracy charges and that's when they took him out of state court and brought him into federal court and so um, uh, it, it's a terrible thing because he was one man that I really believe could have come out and really brought together young brothers across this country uh, and, and brought them to the table to vote and that's where the power is and that's why they, I believe there was a collective conspiracy to have him locked up. I know there is. Let me join the issue this evening by reading to you from John Cass's story in last week's Chicago Tribune. Quote, a convicted murderer, a convicted drug dealer, and a former ranking member of the Gangster Disciples all with ties to Disciples boss Larry Hoover and his political arm, stood Wednesday with the president of the Chicago Urban League, one of the city's most respected organizations, to tout a voter registration drive. And the story went on, only a few blocks away, a federal drug conspiracy trial continued. It has bolstered prosecutors' contentions that Hoover's political group, 21st Century Vote, was run by gang members and funded with drug money and street taxes. End of quote. Our efforts with them have been certainly above board, very legal. We do not condone any type of criminal behavior by 21st century vote members if they are involved or anyone else. The fact that Bolaire Hoover was able to let individuals know through the resurrection CD by Brother Jay and the Ghetto Boys when he say real gangsters go to the polls. Where the truth is, niggas in the street got to get together all over the nation. Not the regular people in the street. I'm talking about street niggas. I'm talking about niggas that call themselves gangsters. Real gangsters go to the polls. Look, yo, what up, y'all? This is Common. I got to say, you know, I grew up in Chicago where it was brothers and folks and Larry Hoover, everybody knew about Larry Hoover and him being a leader and him doing, doing some things in the community. And, you know, at first we thought it was just gang but he really was showing leadership and try to do some things to change stuff. And when he got locked up, I heard he tried to really get, get him on the right path. So, you know, it's like this. I know Larry Hoover's son, Larry Hoover been, been a real cat. Everybody, you know, go through they, they, they dirt and everything. He turned it around and trying to make change in the city. We got love for Larry Hoover. We seen the brothers and the folks coming together. It's all love, so y'all stay up, baby. You know, you clock in the But as I picked up the literature that Mr. Hoover put together, our board of directors put together, it made a call, it made a call for us to make a conscious effort to do the right thing inside of the community, to put them guns down and go to the polling places. They're just like organized crime, and that's what they want to do. They want to create a front, and they want to slow down uh, the actual violence, so we'll get off their back. They're not fooling us at all. Hoover was now in the political arena, and like any political arena, the opposition would look for dirt. While Hoover was campaigning his troops, the government was in his closet. The nine women and three men on the jury get a glimpse of what's ahead. The federal government alleges Hoover continues to run the gangster disciples from his prison cell. He and the six others are on trial accused of running a multi-million dollar drug ring, dealing heroin, cocaine, and marijuana. Prosecutors also believe the defendants funneled drug money into political organizations like 21st Century Vote. Speaking for two hours, U.S. Attorney Ronald Safer tells jurors he has no doubt the evidence will prove guilt, including secretly taped audio recordings. Safer reveals the jury will hear for itself conversations between Hoover and fellow gang members visiting his cell. We knew that Larry Hoover somehow was communicating with the gang leaders on the street. Because one thing everybody was agreed on, Everybody we talked to inside the gang, anybody we talked to who had observed the gangster disciples, Larry Hoover was calling the shots. It wouldn't take long before the government would find the skeleton it needed to bring him up on more charges. Because of his political ties and the GDs being under the authorities' microscope, it made it easy to blame street activities on him. As Hoover slept, the feds came on August 31st, 1995, 4 o'clock in the morning. Hoover was commanded to get up and get dressed. He was taken to the warden's office and met by three carloads of federal agents. He was handcuffed, rearrested, put in an unmarked car, and driven to an airport. Arriving in Chicago at a federal courthouse, a judge informed him of his new drug conspiracy charges. Hoover stood stunned and pleaded not guilty. 
What's so profound about what's happening now is the fact that my brother is locked up, been locked up for 30 years, and every time something happened in the streets, they attribute it to him. There's renegades out there that's, that's, that's not adhering to the leadership call. Being in jail is fucked up as it is. But when you're in jail and you fuck up, you usually get a ticket. They'll take some good time off of your shit. But Hoover wasn't looking at good time. Hoover was looking at life. And while Hoover was looking at his new charges of life for conspiracy, them feds gathered up 250 people and swept the south side, seeking to arrest anybody who had come to visit because they had caught him on tape. With the police sweeps, the authorities felt they had enough to crumble Hoover's organization. But because Hoover respected the game, he knew better than to talk on the phone. He knew they'd be listening. So the authorities flipped the script and turned his visitors into guinea pigs. They went lower than everyday rats. They put wires on any and everyone without them knowing. One way or another, they was going to build them a case. As defendant Hoover and six others accused of being his top lieutenants looked on, a Chicago police officer explained why the federal government decided to bug Hoover's visitors at a downstate prison. Mary Hodge told the jury Hoover simply wouldn't discuss gang business on prison telephones. But because of the Fourth Amendment right, nobody has the right to come and put a bug on another individual with, without his permission to go and hear any conversations for that evidence to be used. Well, the big issue, uh, the issue that when I reviewed everything that everybody, that, any lawyer that had anything to do with this case thought was the biggest issue of the case was the suppression of the tapes themselves. There's federal statutes that guide the process of the wiretaps, how these tapes are sealed and there was, they didn't follow, the government didn't follow the procedure that's dictated by the statute. Well, I think the Vienna tapes should not have been allowed basically because we believe that the government obtained these tapes illegally uh, in violation of the wiretap laws, in violation of the U.S. Supreme Court laws dealing with wiretaps. The difference between right and wrong is when you know you're wrong but been getting away with it for so long, you think you're right. The tactics used by the government were at the time mind-boggling to say the least. A wire was implanted in all of the visitors' passes at Hoover's jail, allowing the government to hear all said without the knowledge of even the visitors, and of course not Hoover. Unfair and unconstitutional to say the least. As bad as I hate to say this, even a snitch knows he's wired. But not one visitor was aware that they were being used down and dirty, the government proceeded to start what they called a fair trial. And however foul, it was the government, so it was fair game. Bugging a visitor's pass, you know, maybe that's not just a crazy idea. I, I wonder if that could be technically possible. And uh, let's get the group in here and let's brainstorm this. You create these visitor badges and we'll implement them at four separate institutions so that nobody is terribly suspicious because if you introduce something new to a prison system the prisoners will be quite alerted to the fact that they may, there's something up the first thing that became apparent was these tape recordings were very difficult to hear. There was a lot of background noise, a lot of distractions, and of course, Larry Hoover and his visitors weren't screaming out the conversations about this illegal activity. And yet, 
We could hear it. It was tantalizing. They talked all about how the gang was making its money. Directions from Larry Hoover about who would run the operation. Directions about where the drugs would go. Who they should get the drugs for. Everything you could imagine. If you take the government's uh, position and say, this is what Mr. Hoover said when he didn't know that the government was listening, you have to also take these portions where he also didn't know that the government was listening, and he talked about the good things that this organization was becoming and the, the things that this organization was doing to be helpful to the community. And see, that's another thing that the GD did, that they were feeding the community, they were getting these shows, uh, they had the clothing line going on, these are very smart, uh, you know what I mean, entrepreneurship thing that they was pulling off that people weren't really looking at. With the evidence the government had, Knowing it should be inadmissible, they continued to proceed. They knew all they needed was 12 minds like their own, and as hard as it sounded, it wasn't. Millions believe in an America that bullies. Look at our leaders, so it ain't hard to tell. Hoover was sure to be convicted. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please answer yes or no as I No, they gonna lie. They gonna say whatever they wanna say. Well, you say the truth. Was the verdict as just read as to count one your true and individual verdict? They put a hit on him. The hit wasn't to, to just shoot him Jury or anything three. of that nature. Jury because four. he's still used to it. Yes. Jury number five. Yes. Jury number six. Yes. Basically, the prosecution tried to say, um, GD, we, do, we didn't do nothing but sell drugs and gangbang, kill people, innocent people. Jury number eight. Well, you are a great Jury speaker. When a crime was committed, I was, I was, I was a kid. If there's anything that you could say to your son right now, what would you say to him? Well, you know, I would say to him, Larry, just pray. There's a God in heaven. <clears throat> We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant guilty. They say you should never judge a man until you walked in his shoes. And if you was in Hoover's shoes, you'd be walking for your life. And with Hoover literally doing just that, what else does he have left? With his newly added six life sentences, seven two-year sentences, and four three-year sentences, on top of his original charges, all he has left his hopes of an appeal. And an appeal is a constitutional right granted to all, no matter your personal opinion or your belief. It is a process that acknowledges the possibility of wrong in a case. And this process is and can be used for the prosecution as well as the defense. Based on the present laws that govern, the case isn't over. I feel as though he should get his appeal, you know, especially if it's by the law of the land. He Oh, that if that due process of the law, they should give it to him. So when he comes back to court, they can't even use those bogus tapes. So all those they told and lied on him, for what? Hoover deserves due process for his case. Guilt or innocence is not for our judgment. Judgment should be for right or wrong. And no matter how wrong or right we may or may not be, when you catch a man, catch a man right to convict him of wrong. And until you do that, how can America lead? How can you expect one to believe in justice when the injustice still continues to play? And trust me, son, there's an injustice being played somewhere right now, and niggas be talking that slick shit about they got game. But understand that you and me ain't got shit on their court, and until we see that there's a Hoover on any block, on every fucking corner, we're gonna continue to stay in and out of steel box. And one better, they don't give a fuck what you are. Gangster, blood, Latin king, neutron, whatever. In their own words, ignorance is no defense in a court of law. So now you know. Let's see what you niggas do with it. They say you really don't know a person until you've been with them for a while. Well, I'm here to change all of that. I'm new to you. Feel like I grew with you. 
I blame my mother for my sympathy, my father for my attitude, my grandfather shook his head, I think my grandmother knew that I was born different. T.T. Ben said that I was gifted, probably why my brother never listens. My cousins only come around only cause I rap now. No such thing as friends when you lay your tracks down. Faces in the videos are running into silly hoes to try to get pregnant. They use my child just to get them both. Now back home and shit, man. Niggas doing that. Well, they doing it now and shit with the blood and all that. But they ain't really doing the gang shit. It's about everybody trying to get some money. You know, you got a little bit of something drugs now, man. It's disgusting. Got a nine to five job, as a matter of fact. I'm lying, but I got this poetry in this set. And I'm out here trying to slang it like crack. This music business make you mad enough to go back. I'm talking about all this fake friendship shit. And them sometimes, and you know how them get. Look, haters hate, that's the way of the world. And the Lord got his hands on me, so I sink in boys and girls. Still getting dirty looks from the deacons and preachers around. Shake his hand, passing by, they smelling the reefer. And that's cool. Too, baby, I be off in my zone. No offense, and if it is, I read my Bible at home. See, my mind is on this music, my friend. Usually with no end, so I'm trying not to lose it again. So I smoke till it's gone, and I get some more. No cigars, damn, I guess I better hit the stove. Yeah. I grew up in it every day, man. You know, and, um, you know it's real. You know, obviously, I think if we're not in it, you know, it's something that you don't need to get a part of. You know, I had an outlet, you know what I'm saying? I was an athlete, I was able to get out of it. And never had to really go in that direction, but, um, you know, respect all the guys in the streets and the struggles they went up to. And, you know, this is where I'm from, you know what I'm saying? So this is what I love, I love it. Everything about it, I love it. You know, who was to everybody, but I love everything about Chicago. It's just what makes up the city. I done roughed up niggas since a one plus nigga. Uh -huh. It's hot the gun box and cut cuss niggas. Uh -huh. Fuck niggas, I don't fuck with uncut niggas. A must, I get stuck, it's much, much bigger. Ooh. Six figure, big nigga, up in the click nigga. So if I get with you, gotta show you the big picture. Uh -huh. Most sicker than your ass, so come real. Got down with Mike, so let's call it a done deal. Done deal. Eating big pot meals, so I'ma stay swole. Ever my waist goes, and 54 takes clothes. Never uh -huh. take holes. Unless I name fake souls uh -huh. And I hate foes Them niggas throwing fake bows I'ma oh. break toes And show them how to waste uh -huh. rolls Step in the place flow With niggas yelling make pose right. Watching pecs fold With guns by the cake slow uh -huh. My niggas uh -huh. are late Tony uh -huh. Montana uh -huh. get his face Come on No basic what I feel about it You gotta know the right brother Going through a struggle You know Being down Yeah so basically what it is, is just a simple, a simple plan is just to keep it down. Down in Dallas, in the whip, she the wildest. Told me her heart's callous, and she ain't want no love from me. Just want to kiss and hug me. Rub the city on her tummy whenever she thinking of me. But need is different though. She don't really like rap. Said she wish Kuzi could sing instead. But need a love for play. She freaky in the band. Believe it, I'm on B. Whenever in DC, yeah, Connie be needing me. She gets the exclusive D. She lives over the border. Gets a wood mail order. She got my catalog. My number one subscriber. I gotta keep my back in shape. Connie's a rider. But nothing was better than the more hand twins They did everything together, made your boy's head spin Wow, one kiss down low, the other's a bone It's not a menage, this is bunk band love Tell me what's it gonna be, baby girl, you and me, what? Gang life was ridiculously crazy uh, I ran a lot from the gang, a lot So I wouldn't get recruited, but you know It's all good, you gotta go with the neighborhood side I was, you know I thought I was a vice lord, but I was really nothing, so. Smoking her for twist, they got drove buds and uh, you think you fly so what? Ain't nobody fucking with the Witty City, but y'all gonna be salty when the shot blow up. 
Catch you open when you creep two steps. Smoking while I listen to the spoken words of Malik Youssef. Killing he who slept. Now do y'all thing. Better get your weight up or shot time to leave you. Ate up, nigga, you gon' hang. So, uh. Give me trust. For the betterment of black people, stop these kids from killing each other. There's too many black youths dying. At this point, they got more black young funerals than they have old ones. That's because ain't no one speaking up. You know, it's gonna take a concerted effort to make this thing work. I say that's, 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 that's the church. That's the, that's the schools. That's got the elders in the community. That's got that's the street gangs. And you can't alienate them. They don't alienate them to the point where they oppose them. But it's home to us. The projects. For sure. Look at it. My home. It's a beautiful thing, ain't it? Yes, it is. You might ask, how can I love a place See? like this? Yeah, well, the projects is my address. This place address. taught me some shit that no school or university Please can teach. It. Uh -huh. Taught me how to survive in these Chicago streets. Taught me how to hustle. You would believe what my eyes have seen. What my ears done heard coming up in these projects. You don't understand what my life is like. You don't understand, no. And how my life are the tears I cry. Tears, tears I cry. I remember staring up at the ceiling. Apartment 311 in my project building. The crib stay smelling like cocaine. I was used to it, so it was no thing. No shame. Mama kept smoking. Day in and day out. What you know about living in a smoke house? What you know about your best friend laying on the motherfucking sidewalk with his brain blowed out? Have you ever been bust at? To the point of damn near getting killed and did you bust back? I remember mama bust in, caught me cutting crack. The way I felt, nothing can describe. You would believe what my ears have heard coming up in these projects. You don't understand what my life is like. You don't understand, no. And how my life are the tears I cry. Tears, tears I cry. But you know about going with your mama to back crack, to back rain. You motherfuckers ain't felt the pain. Mm -hmm. I know you can I done lived it, I done done it. Made me sick to my stomach like niggas lived it, ain't done it. Me and my dad off and on. Cheap shit every now and then. My stepfather hustling and pimping. Now my older brother snorting. My little brother was four months. I'm seeing nothing for a shame. Niggas I don't even know in my living room torching. Niggas you ain't seen nothing. Grab a sack and smoke something. And just listen to this real shit on me with my eyes. I ain't saw my mama die in these projects. Big brother got killed in these projects. Father killed himself in these projects. Nigga shot me ten times in these projects. Crazy bitches stabbed me in these projects. I ain't stuck niggas up in these projects. Sold drugs, ran from popos in these projects. Went to the joint from these projects. Made five thieves in these projects. It gets no real.